2nd October 2015, a hillside village in Guatemala is wiped out by a landslide. The cause? Deforestation. Charia, a coal mining town in India, where for the past hundred years an underground fire has been raging, affecting the lives of more than a million people. 1st April 2017, Mokoa, Colombia. 300 people are killed in a mudslide, with scores more missing. These dates and places might not mean anything to you, nor probably the numbers I mentioned thereafter. But these are not just mere statistics. They are the number of innocent human lives that have been sacrificed as a direct consequence of environmental degradation. And the worrying thing is that the past two decades have seen a drastic escalation in such disasters. It's as if nature is finally saying that our time is up and is heading back. But instead of taking note, our energy-hungry economies continue to raise our virgin rainforests emitting millions of tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere that choke our skies, spewing, the industry spewing out millions of chemicals that poison our rivers, lakes, and oceans, all in the name of development. Many of you might have read or even heard of the Brundtland Report of 1987, and three decades ago, it urged the world to adopt sustainable development by defining it as development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. This was the basis of the Future We Want outcome document of the Rio Plus 20 Earth Summit, as well as the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. But the main question is, who will monitor the implementation of all these goals and outcome documents, their efficacy? Who will set and decide the milestones? The policy makers who drafted the SDGs probably won't be around by 2030 to see what the world is like, which 2030, the target date of the goals. It will be us, the current generation, that will be living through that future. Do we have the capability? Yes, we do. But do we have the means? The answer is sadly no. There are millions of young people out there who don't have homes, who have been displaced due to war, strife, climate change-induced disasters, who go to bed hungry. All these children deserve to be a part of the sustainable development agenda. And that is why Green Hope Foundation was established, to provide children and youth with the platform to learn about sustainability challenges and then how to take actions to mitigate them. My name is Gehkesha. I'm 18 years old. I am the winner of the 2016 International Children's Peace Prize, a United Nations human rights champion, and one of the top 25 women of influence in Canada. My green journey began when I was eight years old, when I planted my first tree on my eighth birthday. I worked tirelessly in the field of sustainability since that day, and when I was 12 years old, I was at the Rio Plus 20 Earth Summit in Brazil, where I was the youngest delegate to address a press conference, which was on stopping land degradation on the World Day to combat desertification. Green Hope Foundation has therefore been the voice of future generations for years now, for six years actually, because we firmly believe that children and young people must be a part of agenda setting, policy making, and implementation 
and should not just be left on the fringes of decision making because it is our future that we are talking about. We have been the voice at several of youth at several high level United Nations conferences. For example, after Rio Plus 20, we've had the high level political forums, open working groups and intergovernmental negotiations, all to decide what the SDGs would be. And Greenhope had the privilege of attending all of them. This culminated in the United Nations Sustainable Development Summit in 2015, where we had the privilege of being one of the 193 youth selected to represent our constituency at this summit. And it was held during the historic 70th session of the UN General Assembly. And it was a huge honor to listen to several eminent speakers, such as His Holiness, the Pope at the United Nations. Now the global goals are the people's goals. But what I have noticed in all my travels around the world is that even though young people play such an important role in their implementation, most of them don't even know what the SDGs are. So how can we even play a role in its implementation if we have no idea what they are? So this is the mission of Green Hope Foundation as a social innovation platform to empower and engage these children and young people all around the world. We developed a very special tool called Environment Academies, which is essentially a workshop organized by children for children. And we have conducted over 120 environment academies in 20 countries to date. Now, it is not just about speaking that gets the message forward. We use very creative modes of communication, such as music, art, dance, and drama, so that we can transcend the language and cultural barriers of the children that we interact with. We use art in the form of art workshops and art competitions. We also use art from waste, and this is where fashion comes into play. Because when we give these children at our academies recyclable items like plastic bottles, newspapers, cans, they make the most amazing outfits out of them and have their own fashion show complete with a catwalk. We use dance uh, as a way of breaking the ice in the form of flash mobs. We also give children the opportunity to choreograph their own dances based on a theme related to sustainability. We use music. Green Hope has a band where we sing, rap, beatbox, play different instruments, and we compose our own songs on peace, climate action, our experiences in our projects all over the world. And we give students the opportunity as well to make their own music. For example, when we were in a Syrian refugee camp, which I will talk about later, an eight-year-old boy came up to the front after hearing us uh, sing our, and rap our climate song. And he rapped about his experiences and the trauma that he had gone through. And this was really monumental because that boy had not spoken for months. And that was the first time that he was able to express his thoughts and emotions. But this time, not through speaking, but rap. We use drama where we write our own plays and perform them and give students the opportunity to do the same. To engage children in the climate action process, I wrote a book when I was 11 years old called The Tree of Hope, which was officially launched at the United Nations Children's Summit in 2015. And the story follows a young girl named Khadra, which is green in Arabic, uh, where she engages her friends to turn her village into a green oasis by planting trees. Also, that book is now available on Amazon if you want it, and it's also available in several school libraries across the world. 
Sports plays a very important role in the Green Hope agenda. We have taken part in the Sustainable Development Goals Soccer World Cup in Dubai and New York, where each team chooses to play for a particular SDG. And we chose goal 13, that's climate action. And this is a very special World Cup because it is only for girls and promotes the fact that girls and women play an integral role in sports and all other aspects of life. In accordance with the erstwhile UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon's words to leave no one behind and achieve a life of dignity for all, Green Hope conducts soccer and cricket matches that engages the people who help us. So our tailors, our gardeners, the people who clean our venues, the people who drive our buses. And we have very fun-filled days with sports, as well as awareness raising about sustainability. Additionally, we work with environment and STEM education, where we talk to students as well as teachers about how to incorporate environment into STEM. So it's not just workshops and academies that we do. We complement these with grand level local actions. We have planted more than 15,000 trees all across the world. We work on renewable energy, where in 2015, we went to the run of Kutch, which are the salt pans of India. V very, very terrible conditions over there. And we distributed 100 solar lamps to the children living over there, which was actually the first time that they had a source of light at night. We are also the youngest members of WIRE, which is Women in Renewable Energy in Canada. We promote the concept of adopting sustainable living as a way of life. And in accordance with this, we have recycled over 100 tons of waste. We do community engagement campaigns to talk to people in the urban environment, going door to door and telling them how they can manage their urban waste. We have cleaned up over 100 beaches worldwide and conduct very special beach cleanup campaigns, which are secret stub collection campaigns, as they're extremely poisonous to the beaches and the marine life. We also work on mangrove conservation because uh, mangroves play a very important role in acting as a habitat, acting as a natural defense against natural disasters. So we work with mangroves, planting mangroves, cleaning up mangroves in the UAE, Oman, in the Sundarbans, which is the largest mangrove forest in the world, where we planted 300 mangrove saplings as part of our rehabilitation project for a village that was destroyed by Hurricane Isla. So the next time a hurricane hits that village, they will actually have a defense system because the mangroves will act as the natural barrier and protect the villagers. We also worked in Suriname, where we planted mangroves along the Atlantic and South American coastline. So plastic pollution is also plays a very big part in uh, the environment and acts as one of the greatest global challenges. So we work on turtle conservation campaigns because as you can see, marine creatures are some of the animals that are impacted the worst by plastic pollution. We've worked in Suriname with uh, releasing leatherback turtles, learning about their nesting habits, as well as an Oman about the green turtles. And we also had the opportunity to tag these turtles and then release them into the sea. So it's not just sea turtles we work with, but also river turtles, such as in Ontario, where most of the species are endangered. So our main goal is to reach out to all sections of civil society. And now it's not just children and youth who join our campaigns, but also corporates, governments. 
We believe that it's not just the students who should be educated, but the teachers as well, and the school boards. So we are very privileged to work with the Knowledge and Human Development Authority in Dubai, and the Toronto District School Board, and the Ontario Institute of Secondary Education of the University of Toronto in Canada. Now, peace and sustainability are two sides of the same coin. And it is extremely important to talk about peace, in particular nuclear disarmament, for example, when talking about sustainability. So three weeks ago, I addressed the General Assembly of the United Nations on why youth, young people should be involved in the whole nuclear disarmament process on the day of the International Day to Eliminate Nuclear Weapons. And just day before yesterday and the day before that, I spoke at the Parliament of World Religions, also on the theme of environment and nuclear disarmament and the role of children and youth in those processes. My experiences have led me to believe that children are genuinely shocked at the state of the environment. We all should be. And no matter if they live in an affluent country or in a refugee camp, they actually care about what happens to their planet, and we should follow their lead. We celebrated this new year with 600 Syrian refugee children living in neglected and rundown camps along the Lebanon-Syria border. And for these children, survival was a daily struggle. And after we conducted our environmental workshops for them, we were so amazed to see that they were enthusiastically talking about planting trees and conducting a waste cleanup in their camp. A year before that, I was at the Baby Life Home, an orphanage for HIV-positive children in Nepal. And these little angels eagerly discussed during our workshops how they would plant trees that would grow tall and shade their ramshackle home not knowing that they would not be alive to see it happen. We've also conducted workshops for the refugees living in Malaysia about the need to conserve their environment. We engage orphans, other marginalized groups all around the world as well, including uh, tribal and indigenous communities in the Amazon rainforest. We have been very privileged to work with several government organizations where we were invited to speak at the Dubai Expo 2020 International World Majlis held in New York during the General Assembly Week on the topic of 8 billion uh, opportunities. So now Green Hope has over a thousand youth members working on ground level projects in 12 countries across the Americas, the Middle East, and the Indian subcontinent. We work in Canada, in the USA, India, Nepal with our Gift of Education campaign, Sri Lanka, Seychelles, Malaysia, where we actually got to meet the Queen of Malaysia, in the Netherlands, where we have a tree planted in our name and spoke to our largest audience ever, which was 11,000 young people, the Middle East, where we started in Dubai. We were also invited by the president of Suriname to engage the children of his country in the sustainable development process. And we actually engaged the whole country through our art and music workshops, more than 2,000 children and youth, both in urban and rural areas. And we're officially now partnered with the National Youth Parliament of Suriname. And partnerships play a very important role because you can't achieve sustainability if we don't all work together. So our international partners include the Green Belt Movement, Jane Goodall's Roots and Shoots, and the World Bank Climate Change Initiative, Connect for Climate. And our mission is to have Green Hope Foundation in every country of the world so that children and youth can refer to it as a platform where they can learn to live a more sustainable lifestyle. The IPCC report that was released just a few weeks ago is really a final wake-up call for humanity because it says that we 
are on the path to having a global temperature rise of 3 degrees Celsius instead of just 1.5, which is absolutely catastrophic for our planet. But it also says that each and every one of us has to take actions on our own and not just blame others if we have to achieve sustainability. If you look at this image, this is not a Martian landscape, but planet Earth. And this is the run of Kutch, the salt pans of India. And this is what our Earth will look like if we don't act now to save our planet. And a sustainable future will be realized only if we have access to education for all, if we stop discriminating based on gender, race, religion, caste, creed, doctrine. It'll be realized when we bridge the gap between the haves and the have-nots. And it will be realized if each and every one of us takes that one step outside of our comfort zones to make a difference. I believe that it can be done, and I and my team members and I are not going to wait while others are still trying to make up their minds. Because our generation is the last one that has the opportunity to do something before it's too late. And future generations will remember us if, as a generation that saved our planet or some, a generation that condemned our planet to a dry, barren place. So it is time for us to shake off this indifference and act with decisiveness to safeguard the rights of the future generations and save our planet before it is too late. If not for yourselves, then do it for your children. Thank you. Like I mentioned, we use music as a form of spreading awareness about sustainability. So I would like to end by performing a song that I composed after my experience at the Syrian refugee camp, where it talks about how a young person's dream, what dreams were shattered after all the trauma that they had gone through.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Kekasan. Thank you.